Uh, some good news is that uh, we actually have a very live and active audience watching the webcast. We've been up to like 20 or so, and they're, in fact, they're commenting saying we want to see the slides and things like that. So that's terrific. Um, just so you know, we have also, uh, we've contacted the building engineer. I've, I've lowered the uh, thermostat about an hour ago to 66, and I don't feel the temperature in the room getting down a little bit, so we're letting the building engineer come and and see if they can make sure that we get some of the uh, air conditioning come through. Um, but it's uh, the, the, we've got uh, a, it's been going very well, and I'm looking forward to con uh, seeing more of the conversation and more dialogue, drawing on the expertise of the people in the room. So we'll turn it back over to Adam and, and Mark. And again, as, as promised to our webcast audience, uh, we're going to quickly go around the room just to reintroduce everybody for those who uh, joined the webcast after 9.30 or 9.40. So this time, why don't we start with David Fisher? David Fisher of the Capitol News. Uh, Bill Davis of the California Public Radio. Stephanie Bergson at KPBS. <coughs> Suzanne Marvin, the Director of News and Editorial Strategy at KPBS. <laughs> Denise Klein, the Tapas Marley Show. Jenna Kata, Public Radio Capital, Public News Company. Jonathan Byers, the Light Ford Foundation. JJ Yor, Marketplace. Penny Curran, CPB. Harry Lennox, Actor. Ed Miskovich, PBS SoCal. Booker Wade, KMTP, San Francisco. Jamie Kanzler, um, PBS SoCal. Carol Barney, Bayback. David Leroy, Track Media. Jennifer Maitorena Taylor, uh, producer and research fellow at USC Annenberg. Dick McPherson, Fundraising Strategy. Brenda Barnes, USC Radio. David Haas, Winco Foundation. Ernest Wilson, Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, USC. Ed Bime, for Associate Dean, School of Communication, American University. And uh, now we're going to plunge into another uh, market, and we'll see some lessons from San Diego. So let's have our yeah, I'm going to uh, yes, and Mark. Uh, uh, it, this is a pretty radical shift, okay? Because we're taking a station in Nashville. It's a pretty big city market. They have a football team, uh, a, a football team. Um, but but the str the strategy there was to take the fabric of the local community, essentially through you know it, we didn't show you the clips. We had more of it. this Kentucky uh, sorry, Tennessee Crossroads was the program that got the good ratings. This is a a, a soft feature thing. You know, go around and look at interesting spots around around the state. This, now we're going to go into what I, I got to tell you, when, when I walked into KPDS to start to prepare them for this thing, the minute I got in there, I commented to my good friend Deanna Mackey that people were asking, well, why are you choosing KPDS? And if you are in their second floor, right, the second floor? Yeah. Second floor building that we're going to hear about, you would immediately say more people need to know what they're doing. Um, they have the most interesting advanced, uh, really well thought through, fully converged news deal going. And Bill, I, I, I'm sure you, you're following what these guys are doing. You know, everybody in the business would probably know a little bit more about what they're doing. I'm going to start because one thing that we saw, and this is, when, when we, have, David and I observed this, it's just so trite and, and, and it's, everybody would say this, but it's so true. If you, if you, why are the stations in this room, this is going to the success story issue that Jeff raised, you know what, it's leadership. Somebody says, I, I think we should go in this direction, and they gradually get other people to go there, and they have some kind of vision. And let's listen to Tom Carlo and his team, we've got several members here, did this in, in San Diego. Yeah, I did. You know, I've been uh, working at KPBS for 39 years, so I started as an undergraduate student. So I've been in this business a long time, and we're a joint licensee, so I've, I've followed the business of television and radio and public media and public broadcasting. And as the job was beginning to open up in 2008, I really felt this was a time for me to create a vision for the future. And at the time in 2007 and in 2008, Journalism in this country, not just public media and public broadcasting journalism, but broadcast journalism and for-profit journalism, whether it's print media, magazines, and papers, were going downhill. And there were layoffs all over this country. And as I was beginning to, to throw my hat in the ring as the general manager job, 
I felt I needed to have a vision for the future, something that would actually push us forward. And I saw what we had, had uh, grown over the years with our radio station. I mean, Doug Merlin, the general manager before me, had a strong radio background, and he invested a lot in KPBS radio in this community with news, developing a news uh, a initiative. And you know what? 25 years ago, if you would have asked me, could we be number one in radio news in this market? I would have told you you're crazy. You know, we didn't have a news operation. But you know what? We did. And we, we moved up into the number one spot in this community because we invested in local news, we invested in quality news, and the world of commercial radio in this country changed dramatically in the 90s and in the early 2000s with massive consolidation of stations and trying to be more syndic using syndicated work to sound local. So when I saw what was happening and saw our daily newspaper go like that, television, local television news in this market begin to get so opinionism and, and, and sensational that I said, you know what, if we did this on radio, we should be able to do this on all platforms, meaning television and digital media. So I came up with this idea that we were going to take the separate departments of TV, radio, and digital media in this organization and bring them together as one department, one content division. We would invest a lot in training. We would train our reporters and our producers to work on a story that could go to all different platforms. And in other words, we would reach all people at all age groups on how they choose to get their media. And so that's what, that was the first part of it. The first part was to bring it all together. And, and, and when I, and I presented that as, as a, a vision of the future, and I also said that we were going to go after the local news initiative, the quality news, and make sure that our product would complement the work from NPR and PBS. And my analogy that I use was in my history of being in public broadcasting, not only here, but seeing it across the country, I think public broadcasting, in my opinion, built this massive retail mall with specialty shops. The specialty shops being the genres of programming that we have. When you can take kids, public affairs shows, performance shows, how-to shows, cooking shows on the radio side, AAA, classical music, jazz, folks, talk, news and information, Spanish language programming. We, we had this massive specialty shop, uh, uh, retail mall with specialty shops, but you know what? We were struggling. And for a retail mall to succeed, you need an anchor store. The anchor store is what you have to build first to draw people to your shopping center, and then the specialty shops do better. So I felt that we needed to kind of, you know, kind of pull back on a lot of the specialty shops and focus on building our re our anchor store, which was going to be news. So we clear, which was going to be news. And the people who are here are going to talk about how it was built and um, the role that Gips played in making that possible. So I'm going to just now turn over the presentation. And you, you guys are right up in front. And it, the, click to the right side, and you go forward. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Hi, I'm Stephanie Bergson from KPBS. I've been at the station for over 30 years. And fortunately, one of the first things I did is create a producers club of, of people who give us $1,200 a year or more. This is critical because as wonderful as all of this is, all it takes is money, and it takes a lot of money. And when you will see a picture of our new newsroom, which costs $3 million, um, that was as a result of a gift we were able to get from Joan and Erwin Jacobs, who are local philanthropists who I've had a relationship with for over 20 years. So just like the Joan Brock gift, these, don't, these things do not happen overnight. It's a slow, steady, persistent process of cultivating relationships, getting to know people, and matching passions and opportunities. And that's our business. And I have to tell you that um, every time I found the right opportunity for somebody, they run to their checkbook. I had this happen recently with the Masterpiece Theater gifts. You might have heard that I just got two gifts from Masterpiece, one for a million dollars one year, 
and one for half a million dollars one year, both of these donors said yes on the spot because I knew what they were looking for, which was recognition. And I was able to offer one of the donors credit on national public television, which we've never, ever, ever done before in my entire career. And you're going to see her, Darlene Shiley. She's going to do a tape spot. In fact, she's going to Boston in about a week or so to tape a spot. And she's going to do her own credit as Masterpiece opens after Laura Linney. And for her, this was the trigger. So, you know, I've always been able to, well, not always. I mean, believe me, this has taken a lot of work. And there have been moments where I'm hitting my head against the wall thinking, now what? But um, it's, it's seizing the moment. The other donor I had been um, working on for a long time. He was no, he had identified himself in the community as giving away millions of dollars. I had a liaison with one of his senior staff people who was his bridge troll. I had sent numerous proposals, including the masterpiece proposal, and gotten nowhere. And then I realized it was timing because he was in the middle of getting another big gift for 45 million for a hospital. I waited. <coughs> And it was really funny because Rebecca Eaton was coming to town and asked Darlene for her for renewal gift, which the first year had been 250. So she went from 250 to a million, which I suggested we do. Um, and they said to me, "Isn't there anybody else we can talk to?" And I thought, "Well, you know, I'll give it a shot and see if Conrad would like Conrad Previs would like to have lunch with Rebecca." He was available. It happened. He agreed to do it right there. I mean, you know, I had another meeting with him, but he basically made up his mind to do it. Timing was great. Turns out he watched the end of Downton Abbey five times. You know? I mean, this is someone who makes an appointment with TV every night to watch these programs. It's part of his life. It's really important. And he was, at that moment, ready to make that gift. Um, so you have to get, one of the other things I've done at KPBS that has been very successful is create destinations for donors. And you may have heard about the news beef that we created. This is the way we fund our reporters. Our first reporter, our first beat was the Environmental Reporting Fund. And I call these funds and beats so that we weren't um, limited in the terms of the number of donors we could have to them and the amount of money we could get and, and you know, tying them to a particular reporter. So Carolyn Dick Hertzberg had self-identified with an original $10,000 gift after um, a meeting in La Jolla at someone's house. So Kevin Close was coming to town. I thought, you know, give it, bringing him into the conversation with them would give the whole thing context. I'm willing to use anything I've got in my arsenal to try to get people's attention and to try to elevate the um, impact of their gift. Kevin went with me to meet with the Hertzbergs. We took Ed Joyce. Now, we don't do this anymore, but at that time, I was taking reporters with me to do the fundraising because he could talk about environmental reporting. Since then, we've decided it's probably not a good idea. But fortunately, we have Suzanne who can who can do that. Be the firewall. I the firewall. Create the firewall. She can do a really good job of that. So the Hertzbergs came forward with the first environmental reporting fund. They get credit um, through run of schedule spots, not attached to any program, not attached to any report. They just run through the schedule. Environmental reporting on KPBS has been made possible with the generosity or a gift from Carolyn Dick Hertzberg. But you know, as many times as I've, I've had people tell me we don't want the credit, they all want the credit. Mm -hmm. And once they get, they start hearing their friends say, oh my god, I heard you on KPBS. I saw you on KPBS. Darlene Shai said people have run across the deck of her cruise ship in the middle of nowhere to tell her that they've seen her. She said people stop her in Home Depot. So this is one of the most powerful tools we have to get major donors involved with our station. It's fabulous. Subsequent gifts have come from a variety of sources, individuals, foundations, and corporations. We asked for, we were asking 80,000 years to 90 a year, and we've had multiple funders. I decided to create a science and technology fund because I thought it was so important to cover science and technology in San Diego, and we have three funders for that right now. They renew, and I wanted to create three-year commitments because, number one, I didn't want to have to go out looking for money after a year. Really, it was selfish. And then number two, I realized we couldn't really bring in anybody unless we um, you know, were able to say, look, we'll give you a three-year commitment to this position. So it's really worked out well. And again, the recognition has been great. And now we're recognizing recognize them on TV and on the web as well, because we're doing multiple platform reporting. Um, in 2006, NPR and KPBS approached Joan and Erwin Jacobs. Of course, you, you, know, you've seen, you haven't seen the news center, but you'll see that. 
And we asked him for $20 million because we were going to do a collaborative project. Um, Kevin came out. We were going to do you know, this big journalism project. We presented it. They came back and said, no, we'll give you a million dollars. And we'll give it to you over five years. So you know, your first inclination would be, well, this is not what we had in mind. How can we do this? But Tom wisely said, let's take it and do what we can. And we created a small recording lab. And we call it Training the Journalists of Tomorrow Today. And we started tr uh, training an internal a person who was already on the staff and hiring a fellow and giving them a year of training in multimedia <coughs> platform recording. So this has been fabulous. Can I ask a quick uh, question? Yes. Are you working with um, a UCSD or with uh, San Diego State or any other education partner? Um, San Diego State a little bit, and that now we're working with the Investigative News Source, which started at San Diego State and has its own 501c3. And that's another collaboration that I just got a half a million dollars for. So anyway, yes, collaboration is key. And anytime you can do that, it's great. But we haven't done anything with UCSD yet. We've been unaware of them. They don't have a journal. Right. We, we work with Voice of San Diego a lot. Um, we recruited the two journalists. In 2008, I went back and we proposed the larger scope. One of the things I've done is I reported back to donors every year with a thorough analysis which Suzanne and her staff have reported about what the impact <coughs> of their gift has been, the stories that the reporters have given us, and what they've achieved. And I actually took the fellows and the interns to meet with the Jacobs after the first year, and I did that the second year. The third year, they came out and met with us, and we proposed a larger scope, and they increased their gift. To, they increased it to 800 and some thousand dollars a year total. Last year, they renewed, last December, they renewed the gift again, in addition to what they gave us for the um, new center, the $1.8 million over three years. Um, 2009, I went to the Jacobs with the president of San Diego State University for another big proposal that KPBS kind of was a, a secondary part of. There were some components in it, but the key component, and this is so funny, was a model that the students at San Diego State had put together for one of John Decker, our program manager's classes. One of these cardboard models of what the KPBS newsroom might look, in the future, look like in the future. And we threw this in there, and I said, well, how much do you think this would cost? Thinking this was really a long shot. And we said, one and a half million dollars. We had two meetings with them. The president said, what do you think of this proposal? We said, they said, we're not interested. So thank God I said, is there any part of this that looks appealing to you? And Joan Jacobs said, well, what about this renovation? They love putting their names on the house. They just gave $75 million to put their name on the hospital. By the end of the moment, it took five or 10 minutes. By the time we walked out of their house, they had agreed to give us a million and a half dollars to renovate KPPS. We had to go back because it ended up costing $3 million. And Erwin said, and I identified the architect. I'd read about this wonderful architect named Jennifer Luce who designed the Nissan Design Center. And I had called one of my friends and said, you know, I think she'd be great to do this. She's so innovative. She's done fabulous work. Um, could we get her? But maybe we couldn't. And the next thing I knew, my friend had called her and lined her up. The university fought us on this. And they wanted to hire architects that they had worked with who designed churches and designed the worst corporate office I've ever seen. For the San Diego Symphony, it looks like a dungeon. I mean, it's dark, it's wood, it's closed in. So we got Jennifer, and Tom and I just stood up against the university and said, this is our money, this is our project, the Jacobs are funding this, we want them to walk in and say, wow. So we held firm and got Jennifer. She spent months working with the staff and identifying what they wanted. And, they, and, and through the um, process, keeping the Jacobs informed, taking, them to meet, taking Jennifer to meet them, talking about everything, we ended up with this phenomenal studio, which Mark was just talking about. So we have our producers club, our $1,200 over members. It's now going to produce about $1.2 million this year. To give you context, there are four people in my department. There's me and another major gifts officer. She does plan giving. We do the producers club. We have two assistants. And we raise about $3 million a year. Membership raises with, I don't know how many people they have, $6 million a year. So the money is in major gifts. I mean, I have three meetings set up with donors to renew or increase their gifts in the next two weeks. Follow up, follow up, follow up, trying to you know, keep in touch. The cultivation, the follow up afterwards is as important as the initial gift. Letting them know about the impact, it's really key. Um, and I 
and that's the story, and this is what the KPBS Jonah Irwin Jacobs News Center looks like. It's really spectacular. Um, you can't see our offices, they're on the other side. And before, this was a cubicle farm, completely closed in, nobody had any light except you know, the executives alone with the fire balls. And now it's flooded with light, and um, it's fully converged, and it allows us to do what we do best. We're going to take a break to take some questions. Stephanie, let's just, if you want to sit down and relax, okay. or you can sit in David's chair there, okay. and then we'll bring Suzanne on. But uh, I'll, let me begin with a question I have. When you shift to looking to get money for news, was it harder than the money that you're, the major gift effort you had when you were taking these national, you know, very well-known series to people? No, because I decided to create this beat system and they were very specific. So we had environmental reporting, education reporting, investigative reporting, um, healthcare reporting. When you identify these specific areas of interest, it's much easier to match a donor who may have science and technology who might be interested in that particular area and who will get excited about sharing that kind of information in the community than it is to go generically say, we need money for reporters. People can't grasp that. You know, you have to have something that people can imagine and relate to. I mean, we're all that way. You know, I give money of my own to different things in, at this go, <coughs> and the first thing I look at is impact. I mean, am I going to be able to make a difference with what I'm doing? So, no. Uh, JJ, let me ask you. You always have to raise money. How, how do you, when you hear this story, do you, are you envious? Do you think we're doing the same thing? I, I have a story I could tell just like that. What's your reaction? <clears throat> we don't have a story we could tell like that, and I started to have a conversation with Stephanie before she went up there. Um, really to, to ask her um, about how you, how you might imagine um, me and my role as a national, running national production entity, uh, partnering in the way that they've done uh, so successfully with, with NPR. Because it seems to me what, for Marketplace, we have essentially uh, three revenue streams and major giving is not one of them. We need to add that. It's been part of our plan. I will say that there is a lot of, um, uh, skepticism inside our company about whether that's actually a viable strategy. So I think there's a, another conversation we because could have. Because of the interference of donors or the perception of influence? Is that, is that no, I think it's the because... Possibility. Yeah, possibility of success because huh. if you think about the public radio revenue model, it's kind of the reverse of an academic institution, right? Where we have many, many, many small donors, right? You beg for $100 mm -hmm. and you got lots of people. We have not much of a history of getting the million, 50 million, 200 million dollar gifts the way a place like USC, for instance, is just masterful at. So I think there's a question about can we in fact do that? And so, so I've had that position budgeted uh, for one year and it's not built. Well, Vinny, the CPB is investing in, in major gifts at least, at least 10 years. So, yes, jealous. 15 by the way. years. Jealous, okay. <laughs> is it working? Is it, are we seeing the cultivation of larger gifts, the acquisition? I haven't run numbers on the radio side. On the television side, it was, you know, we had a project that ran for three years, and then we looked at it. And what I what I found, when I personally kind of looked at the numbers, was that um, it was very successful in a limited number of markets. Mm. They happened to be the largest markets, and I don't know exactly why that was. It may be just that there are more people. Um, it may be that the quality of the staff was better in those markets. But when you got to the medium size and small markets, I think what what, what what you saw was that the costs of raising the gifts was about what you were bringing in from the gifts. Wow. Ooh. So, wow. Uh, well, I'm not surprised. And in fact, what I told NPR right after the crop gift was pick out a few markets that have the biggest prospects, mm -hmm. work with them, have some big hits, and get some early success, and then everybody else will follow. But you can't get everybody on board. Do they do it's it? not realistic, it's not possible. Do they do it? No. <laughs> I mean, but I've, I've been saying this for 10 years. I mean, it's the only way. We've got to pull together. I tell our local donors, you know, 80 or 90 percent of our programming comes from NPR or other sources. It's not local programming. I mean, we have all these reporters. And yes, they do spot stories, but, you know, if NPR and all these other national news sources went away, what would we have? It's nuts. I mean, it's suicidal for us to think otherwise. So, yes, I would, you know, I think Masterpiece, the Masterpiece um, concept of splitting the gift, is brilliant. The WGBH did. Mm -hmm. Took away the fear from me. It gave my donors a much bigger opportunity that they probably wouldn't have responded to just <coughs> locally. And 
it's a model that we can roll out in other ways. I think it's a great idea. Because okay, it has a certain point, people want big opportunities. Out of respect, I'm going to let Ernie go first and then Dick and then Carol. Just, just a, <laughs> a kind of a, almost an empirical <coughs> question. If I understand what you're saying, it's that the national program has a dis really drives a lot of the, the funding. Well, I don't think people make the distinction, yeah. But I, I guess the question I would ask is what would be your expectation for in other words, how much local production could you do in San Diego to add to the national program? I mean, do you see as an optimal 50-50? 30, 70, 70, 30, because in some ways, rhetorically, what we say is what makes us different from, you know, a lot of the other uh, systems is that we do local reporting. We are local. We are your station. And yet, when you look at the numbers, that's less clear. And so I'm just wondering what would be your estimate of where you think you want to get to in increasing the share of local production relative to national production which then I assume might have some impact on funding. Well, that's a question for Suzanne. Well, how would you respond to that? I mean, I wouldn't put a percentage on it, but obviously, and this will be what I'm going to do next, you know, we're really committed to creating local <laughs> news programming, and I don't, I don't know if you're pulling any extracts from those other local shows we've had that have been really successful crossing South, San Diego historic places. Um, I think, you know, that sense of community, that sense of place, that's a big driver, uh, has been on the radio side of support and Tom Carlo, our general manager, clearly believes it'll be a driver of support on television. Too. Ernie, let's hold on to that question and allow you to answer it more. And then I go uh, to ahead. What, David? No, no, no. Go ahead. Carol. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know. You, I assume you have a, an endowment for the news center. No. Okay. Oh. And uh, if you also, if you have foundation gifts. Yes. In what, what kind of dimensions of foundation gifts? Well, Margaret Cargill, for example, like the Akalog Resource Foundation, she's giving, that foundation's giving us about 700000 a year. And since it's a resource foundation, we were designated early on as one of their. And then the Parker Foundation gave us some money for um, investigative reporting. And then we have another family foundation that wants to remain anonymous that's giving us about $600,000. So they're local. We haven't gone national because it's local. But, uh, but they're probably you, you had a question? Can I a quick yeah. uh, okay of information because uh, in a 10 second exchange with Bill Davis, it sounds like his his experience is somewhat different in terms of national versus local uh, driving. Uh, sure, uh, great. Driving. Yeah, uh, I mean, so, um, yeah. uh, we have a larger investment. We have uh, five hours in the middle of the day committed to local uh -huh. um, programming, the regional programming, whatever term you want to use. And um, our largest fundraiser in terms of drawing in donors uh, are those local programs. So, um, I, 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 what, what Stephanie Major is, donors we're talking about? Pardon? Major donors? Particularly major donors. Okay. Uh -huh. Because they live in Southern California, okay. so they, you know. But, <coughs> look, you know, <coughs> Stephanie is the acknowledged master in public broadcasting in terms of major gift funders, and she's done more than anybody else in the business. No, so and, glad uh, you brought that up. No, I mean, <laughs> and so, um, uh, I, I'm not uh, di disputing uh, her experience. It's just, in, 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 at least in Los Angeles, we've had more... Uh, a, a better experience generating uh, major gifts from individuals based on local programming efforts. Well, it's we also don't have the, we don't have the local the programming to fundraise yeah, for. I mean, if we, five, if we had five hours a day of local programming, that's what I'd be raising money for. Yeah. But that hasn't been, that's it, not It's a chicken and the egg issue. Right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. Right. And so if they decided this is what we want to do and this is the direction we want to go in, that's where I go. But let, me, let me get Dick's question in. Dick, Kind of a comment. Uh, this is a great example of, uh, Big money goes to big visions, but also to places that seem like a logical response to a big problem. Uh, you know, usually raise money for people trying to fix things or make things better. It's interesting because a lot of this happened at a time when people were watched in horrors. Traditional media were collapsing and newsrooms were getting smaller and they were firing people. People worry about the schools, but they may not think of us as the logical venue for fixing public schools necessarily. But when it comes to reporting, especially on topics, uh, we seem like a very logical uh, you know, kind of first step. So I just would observe that solving a, a problem that we seem fit to solve, which we sometimes claim we can solve all problems, but this is interesting because I wonder if you heard from donors while you were talking to them who were in fact worried about the decline of the San Diego paper or the New York Times getting smaller or something. Did you hear any of that from people? Consistently. And one of the big reasons behind the investigative reporting was that the donor finally 
who I'd also been pursuing for a number of years through several news directors, finally got it and said, you know, this is something we need to do. We need to put our money behind this and make sure this. Because of the decline of our local paper, right. uh, now known as UT San Diego. So let's and Stephanie thinks step in because he walked yeah. into the space and saw it and said, oh, you guys really are the real deal. Yeah, so let's, let's talk about the content. Okay. Did, David, one more question. Did yeah. you, you have a, um, I'm sorry, I don't mean you, did you have yeah. a comment there? Or? I guess I just wanted to put out there, um, I mean, that I think it was great, but you're... <laughs> He's right here. Yeah, well, she I'm missed, I think you missed, uh, I think you uh, inadvertently missed a key component, or you referred to it uh, sort of in passing, but I, I wanted to point out that um, you talked about uh, long-term donor cultivation and matching passion with opportunity. I'm guessing you meant opportunity to get gifts, uh, but the passion in the donors. I think what was maybe underplayed is the quality of the work and the focus because um, there are lots of major donors that are cultivated um, that do reasonably good things, but it doesn't go where you say you're going. So it's one thing to say we're going to do regional news uh, in a substantive focused way. It's another thing to actually do it. Or, I would say in terms of facilities, there are many facilities uh, <coughs> spread around the country with many major donors that may or may not have lived up to the uh, concepts that were uh, <coughs> rightly used to, to produce them. So I think what I like... Sell the idea. Yeah. So, I mean, and they're good ideas. What I like about this example um, is that it's based on really smart strategic thinking and also delivering good work. You might, I mean, you can always get, not always, but often you can get a major donor to get enthusiastic about an idea. It's a lot different uh, if you actually can do sustained good work. It, the, the whole team at KPBS is part of this, so. I just, you, I, no, I'm just. You can make a really, really important point, yes, because if you don't deliver, you're not going to be able to continue. Sure. We Especially for foundations. We have two questions from a <laughs> webcast audience. One is, did your TV operation break even or show surplus over the last three years? And second, if federal funding takes a 20% or greater haircut, quote unquote, what would the impact be on your local operation? Well, we're doing really well on our um, pledge drives. I mean, we did you know four days in one hour the last time for radio. We had 50 people pledge $1,200 to that radio pledge drive. On TV, we're also making our numbers. So, so far, so good. Um, We'll have to figure out what to do. I mean, yes, we're already talking about what to do with these. You take these national hits. I mean, it'll, it'll expand the conversation, obviously. It's a serious problem because we're going to lose money from the state, from California, too. We're going to keep cutting back, cutting back. Right now, we have a reserve, but you know, you can only do that for so long before you take big steps. Let's listen to what uh, they did in the newsroom. And, uh, Sure. Um, the picture doesn't do it justice. <laughs> right. um, so I'm Suzanne Marmion, the director of news and editorial strategy at KPBS. And, um, you know, I thought I'm going to talk a lot here about our convergence um, and the nitty gritty of how we pulled it off. But I wanted to say, even if there are stations that are not joint licensees like we are that have TV and radio, you know, I was at South by Southwest this year and blown away by the potentials of web TV. Our stories have an amazing afterlife on YouTube. You know, I, we've stopped looking at just the TV rating and we're, we're also including in our metrics um, the hits that we get on the web in the long term with our videos. And uh, we talk a lot these days about media partnerships and I believe strongly that we can partner with each other. So stations that are in markets where there's a radio station and a public TV station could come together and act like a joint licensee and, and do some of what we've um, started to do. So, um, I think that we um, have to acknowledge that KPBS had a robust start in news. <clears throat> Years ago, Mike Marcotte was the news director, Kerry Kahn, Russell Lewis, Scott Horsley, the names you hear now at NPR, um, were in a newsroom of you know, about a half a dozen people um, with a really aggressive focus on news. Um, so that is where we started from. Then we did the multimedia fellowships that Stephanie touched on uh, with that funding. Dana Mackey, our station manager, and Mike Marcotte put together a proposal in 2006 to fund this multimedia training to turn the journalists into uh, proficient radio, TV, and web storytellers and, and to know about um, social media. And the way we did this was through this lab. It was a year. It allowed people one at a time to get off deadline, so into a safe space, 
to experiment, make mistakes, and learn how to do this. Um, and then we put them back in the newsroom uh, one at a time. Uh, a big fear for journalists is that this multimedia reporting is going to take away from the quality of my work, which is the last thing that we need to be doing because that's what sets us apart from other outlets. Um, and so <laughs> it turns out that between the technology improving, the skills improving, it's less of an impact than you would think. For instance, getting radio reporters to put scripts up on the web, huge resistance. We literally timed it take your spot story, put it on the web, convert it into AP style, and found out it took 15 minutes. And when the reporters saw that, they said, okay, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Nowadays, it takes longer. It probably takes about half an hour because we're asking people to link back to their earlier stories, to put in an inline, to embed a photo. Um, but still, it's 30 minutes out of your day of reporting um, to get that online. <clears throat> um, let's see. The next in our sequence of <laughs> events was um, Tom Carlo took the news director position that was vacant and turned it into a director of news and editorial strategy job, uh, which was in charge of overseeing radio, TV, and the web. So no silos for the platforms. Um, <clears throat> and a little bit about my story of where I came from <clears throat> is, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I've always done, I've reported for different platforms. Most of my life has been dedicated uh, but to public radio primarily. I was in Africa living the dream as a correspondent and um, <clears throat> uh, filing for Marketplace, for the world, for NPR, Frontline World. Um, came back, decided that journalism was in disarray and I wanted no part of it anymore, so I'd go into teaching. So I was teaching as an adjunct professor at uh, the Columbia School of Journalism, their multimedia boot camp. <clears throat> Along comes this job that I heard about and I said, that's the model. That's the model that's going to save journalism, and if anybody's going to save journalism, it ought to be public media. Um, so that's how I ended up uh, at KPBS in 2010. And um, let's see. My first assignment when I started from our station manager was now finish reorganizing the team. Um, so I did that, uh, which entailed um, primarily writing two positions our senior editor of news, who's focused on that day's news and the next day's news. But notice it wasn't over different platforms. Um, they're mm -hmm. over all platforms, these positions. Um, so he focuses on the A segments of our radio talk show, KPBS Midday Edition uh, and Evening Edition. And then a second position, the senior producer of News Convergence, uh, which is charged with the features, the packages, the long range planning, and getting those stories out across the platforms. Uh, we had a web producer who was under interactive strategy, move them under uh, content. Uh, and our interactive strategy department is focused on infrastructure and that sort of thing. News is entirely in charge of the content now. To launch or to prepare for the launch of the TV show, we took our uh, radio midday talk show. Well, then it was a two hour morning talk show, has three producers on it. <clears throat> I took it from two good hours to one excellent hour, moved it to midday, which is a bigger slot for audience, and that allowed these producers enough time that they could produce a segment for radio, walk that guest across the hall, have that same guest appear on our uh, nightly television show. So that was a, a huge <laughs> step in efficiency. Um, it's worth noting that the radio audience, primarily boomers, TV show, um, mainly 65 and up. So there's not a lot of duplication, so it's relatively okay to take a segment the same topic and have it on those different platforms without duplicating. Uh, lastly, growth. It does take more time to serve those platforms when you're doing that story for radio and for TV and for the web. That is the reality. Uh, even if it's not as much uh, as reporters always fear. Um, so we were able to add positions, um, which was key in 2010, 2011. Thanks to NPR and the Argo project, we added a military blogger. Thanks to the science and technology fundraising, a science and technology reporter and videographer. Thanks to CPB and the Fronteras Desk, an extra border reporter, a social media editor in charge of fronterasdesk.org. And then to launch KPBS Evening Edition, the TV show, we did add a senior producer for the show, two videographers, and a web producer to get the video online. <clears throat> but not a huge number for the show. It was, strictly speaking, we hired three just for the TV show. Um, so this is the org chart. I don't expect you to be able to read it. You do have a copy if you want to. Um, my point is to show you the shape of it. 
This is me and our editorial triumvirate. It's not a bunch of heads over different platforms. It's three editors over all of it and a staff that's trained in all the platforms. So each reporter individually owns TV, radio, and the web. And that seems to be the difference from most newsrooms um, that I've been in. The last thing Mark is going to show an example um, of what we call the converged story, this sort of storytelling where a, a, a piece can appear as a segment on the midday talk show, as a feature, as a web story. You don't want to have uh, your audience going to all different pages to find that, so we pull it all together onto one page um, on that day. So here at the top, uh, homeless students find a welcoming community of Sherman Heights. There's a the video package that would have aired on Evening Edition. This is, uh, in this case, the radio feature, some photos, links back to other stories that our education reporter has done, and the web treatment, which of course is the primary, the print treatment that people are primarily coming in for. Um, we get a lot, a lot of our audience from search, and yes, from all over the country, and at the bottom places to comment. So, it seems like a simple thing, but it's, it's a little bit different way of doing it, these converged stories. Um, it was really important to us that the TV show have a strong web presence, so it's digital first. We actually take the segments that appear on the TV show, break them into um, stories, and upload the video online before the show goes on the air, tweet it out, put it on Facebook. Kind of creates a buzz to get to the show maybe that night. Either way, it's a story that then lives, has its own life. Um, quick quick point of information on that. Uh, you said that television 65 plus, uh, radio, boomers, I know that uh, some some commercial stations are finding that the web audience is also not duplicated. That's younger still than than. Yeah, we found there's a lot of crossover with the boomers, and so it's really still on the radio. People hear a story and they want to go to the web for more information. There's no doubt that's that's a good driver still. It does skew a little bit younger on the web. You know, folks coming in from from search primarily, and social media a little bit younger too. So can we let's let's open it up to discussion today. And I, I, I want to, there's an issue that I think the industry, if you ask me, should be trying to deal with. Here's one station that's actually trying to do what almost every other network is trying to do, which is have a multi-platform news service. And in, in the, the, um, the essay that essentially <coughs> Bill Moyers published and read to the American Public Television Conference, he said, if I could do one thing different in the framing of the way we put public broadcasting together, I would have created a television news service. But when I talked to your staff, they didn't have an optimistic view of how much you could expand your audience by putting a half hour news every single day of the week. And if you look at the the trajectory that television stations have, have taken. We have some veterans here who know this. It's been to take off these kinds of programs rather than to put one on. Why do you think you're going to be able to break through that? Well, there's, I mean, if it's a different demographic <coughs> on TV and they are watching, um, we've immediately expanded the audience by taking the same radio features that we were working on and turning them into TV packages and treatments. And I can get into the nitty gritty of how we do that because it's a little different too. Um, but yeah, that's an audience of 65 and up that were not necessarily listening to the radio and getting those stories. So we've immediately expanded the audience by this every night. I know. I, we have no research on this point, but I'm just going to make a guess that every single one of your radio listeners gets more of the news from television. Gets more. Mm. Gets more of their news from television than they do from radio. That's that's virtually true throughout the United States. <laughs> How does public television create, how do you, you know, no one's taken the step you've taken in the last year or so. Any, any other station you heard? Is it, Bill, is there anybody else who's doing anything like this? We are. But, um, you got a television station? We have videographers. Okay. And well, we've got a joint nice licensee who's, who's, who's gone and, and invested several million dollars in expanding it to local And, and many of the commercial stations are doing yeah. that. I mean, that, that's what's happening on the commercial side. NPR is winning photography awards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Jennifer? Um, I have a question about your union um, situation. Do you have a union issue? No, and it's key. No okay. union. No union. No union. No that's union. an issue. All right. It's a huge um, issue. KQED is coming out next week, and I'll be talking to them. JJ? <laughs> Suzanne, what's the size of the uh, online audience, and what's the revenue? How, how is that working as a... So our online audience, I think, is 400,000. Uniques a month, is that? A month. 
and the revenue, I'm not sure, I've heard, you mean how much we raise on the web? Well, how, yeah, or how do you tell, uh, is that, are you, are you driving any revenue from the fact that you're putting all this on the web and you're spending them whatever money it costs to do that? Is that, does it come back to you in, in any way, or maybe you don't know that, but. I'm not sure I know that about whether, I mean, if we do have advertising and that on the web and it generates some revenue, um, I wouldn't say it's probably a huge driver, just like everywhere. Monetizing the Last question about audience. How big, is, how big is the audience that comes to you, not on your site, I mean, going to the site, but coming to you from search from a whole bunch of other, or do you have any sense of that? Is that part yeah, of the 400,000? These are questions for interactive strategy director. But, um, yeah, sorry. For, but, but no, the, I can say that, that a huge, say our number one driver is search, our number two driver is Facebook. Um, which is vague. Actually, I can answer that question yeah. in part because I track their, That's they are the know. number one station in the country in terms of the percentage of the audience driven by search. And part of, the, mm -hmm. I have talked extensively with the staff and they, they trace that success to the use of the, the software Ellington that was produced in, at the uh, Lawrence, Kansas, Rob, Rob Curley's Because stuff. The, it has the right metadata it's, or it, something? It, or? Uh, they or? say this particular software is particularly effective in setting stories up and, he, and, and, and the way in which the, the metadata is, is displayed and the way in which the stories are displayed. And, and every, I, I list all the hundred stations that I track online and, and one of their rankings is who gets the most search as a percentage, who gets the most uh, referrals of different kinds. Always number one for search is KPBS. And no one else can explain that. No one has any explanation other than well, we, I mean, that's well, probably yeah. right. We do try to adhere to good practices. <laughs> you've got to you, you the, the, the a lot of other best practices. And, and the headlines yeah, and yeah, linking yeah, out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they really have, they have a, a true multi-platform thing going. You know, there's only a couple of places that have been able to really break through because it's very difficult to do the online thing. It's, it's very expensive. Story. Yeah. Um, I'm the least informed around this table about how all this works, but it's <clears throat> striking to me to listen to the conversation <clears throat> and realize uh, for all of you, you think this is an incredibly unique business that you're in. Um, actually, what I'm hearing is that the challenges that you face are the challenges that a lot of other endeavors face, and it's all about leadership. The people who are successful have talented leadership. And it's all about culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and those two ingredients, I, I heard the, well, the head of PepsiCo was in our office a couple months ago, and she said, um, I don't know how we got in this conversation, but she looked up at me, and she said, David, um, culture eats strategy for lunch. Every day. Mm -hmm. Every day. And I thought it was such a, a great comment. And as I listen to this thing, it's, it's I mean, the, there are special things because it's fundraising and all those challenges, but it's leadership and culture. If Deanna Mackey were here, our station manager, that would probably be her number one thing to say. And that's why the org chart is relevant. It's got to be the, the, the structure of the organization and that started at the top to get rid of those silos and the culture, you know, again, we've built on a long history of a station that's been a little more aggressive and innovative. Um, and, uh, and I'm in that scrimmage slide that you had up earlier down there with the journalists trying to lead this change because it's terrifying for journalists to think you're going to mess up the quality of our work with all this darn technology and, and different ways of using it. And I'm just preaching the gospel that, no, we can do this. Okay. Well, I'm curious. I'm, I'm obsessed with space right now. So just this idea, <laughs> this is a great success. Um, and we see this market after market. Um, but when you look at who else is in the news and information space, it's increasing there of late, as include a bunch of nonprofit startups mm -hmm. that are online only. Um, and whether they have aspirations to partner with an over the air part, uh, entity or not, um, they're also in the philanthropy space, they're in the audience development space, and they're trying to develop their own metrics for engagement. And they're focused on sustainability, and that's a big challenge. So I guess my question to you is, you know, you're the leading provider, right? You play the role of sort of the anchor institution, and there are others who are in the shared space with you. And I'm wondering how much thought or deliberate sort of organizing has been put into those relationships and their sustainability. You're talking about partnership? Yeah, with those other entities, because what happens often, you see is, I mean, this is true both with 
you know, three radio stations that are all NPR in the same market. Um, you have one dominant, and the other two sort of sit behind them significantly in terms of audience share and revenue. Um, but with the in the news environment, I mean, are you working collaboratively with them, not just for content creation, but also sort of just what niche do you fill? Just how do you complement one another? Right. Uh, so yeah, I started and, and um, it was all partnerships all the time and it felt very polyamorous. Um, <laughs> so I had to slow it down a little bit because the one thing about partnerships is they're, they're going to work. You have to put time into them and manage them right. Otherwise, it's just a name. Um, so I started, I said, hey, Voice of San Diego, it's long overdue. Let's get together. And it was exciting. And then it was sort of like, well, how do we actually do this? And um, you know, luckily, we got a little bit of funding uh, to support this initiative called Speak City Heights. Um, where we get to work together from the outset on stories and, and team up. Um, uh, but I'd say probably the best example of, um, of this is, is Investigative News Source. Started out as, uh, on SDSU as the Watchdog Institute. And um, literally now they are embedded in our newsroom. Um, we are collaborating from the outset. And this latest funding that we just got for investigative reporting was from a funder who saw the power of that partnership. Because we started, you know, even though we didn't have money, we just worked it out because I really wanted their content and they really wanted to work with us. And um, this funder came along and said, I'm going to fund an investigative producer for KPBS. Well, they said a reporter, but I turned it into a producer. And a data journalist for investigative news source. So we're literally one position for each of us. And the way I'm designing it is this investigative producer will produce their whole team now. They've got a team of about five data-driven or investigative journalists that now we can get onto our platforms because that's a really important step in that process of doing it well. So we go out from the beginning on a story with them, shooting and shaping and helping them to, to be better broadcast storytellers or we take over and do it but use their, their content. We've got a question on uh, on our web. Right. It's a question from a webcast uh, uh, viewer which actually uh, probably also applies uh, to, to uh, our station manager here from L.A. <coughs> Can non-commercial television stations develop local news capacity and audience without a national PBS or other uh, anchor franchise? And though, should we abandon TV and pursue <coughs> radio web partnerships uh, rather than uh, radio television? <coughs> Okay, should we, uh, Al, read the question again? I would, I would not abandon uh, television at all, and I think there are partnerships. <laughs> uh, I think there are television, radio, web partnerships that can be done, and I think it, it should be done. I mean, uh, t television is still, I mean, it, for the near-term future, for sure, the, the, the most powerful selling tool, the most powerful motivating tool. And I think it should. I think uh, local news, for certain, ought to be part of every public television station's uh, uh, program fare. And uh, uh, but I but I also think that it, it can't be just television. You've got to find. It's got to be an all media approach. And for those for those not blessed with a television station, who are not full licensees, I think partnerships are a perfect solution. Bill. Yeah. Um, I, I completely agree. I mean, we have uh, partnerships with um, uh, KCET. We mm -hmm. talked about doing some stuff with KOCE. Mm -hmm. But we also have uh, commercial television partnerships. We work with a local um, NBC affiliate and also with uh, two Spanish language stations. And okay. in fact, I would say what, what's been surprising is on an editorial level, the Spanish language, uh, CAMEX and uh, uh, KWHY, are the easiest to work with because they have sort of aligned their editorial approach with the public radio, at least what we're trying to do in terms of vertical coverage. And so we found easy alignment there. Interesting. Yeah. What's vertical coverage? Uh, uh, specific subject area. So what, what, what we used to call beats or desks, you know, we call them. And how about uh, you guys in you know, KOCE, uh, partnerships in news? We've been following the San Diego model, at least to an extent, by having Voice of Orange County become part of our newsroom. They're an online source for news. Uh, they do a lot of investigative. We decided along the way to put one of their people in our newsroom and they craved video. We could provide them video. So there was a symbiotic relationship where now our news program is beginning to do more stories, source stories from uh, Voice of OC and it's helped to bring up the level of, in, of serious news where the show didn't have that in the past. Okay. Partnership in news? 
Um, okay. A kind of a different partnership, but yes, we have in the past used Associated Press Television Service, mm. which has in San Francisco a, a reporting staff, but of course an international staff as well. And we've used them for local stories as well as for much of the uh, materials we get on our Pan-African Nightly News show because they have uh, bureaus over there as well. So uh, as to the question, PBS, uh, if we can take off other, to off other institutions as well, uh, and I think that was quite right, television still remains the most powerful and persuasive medium ever for uh, impacting behavior. And uh, we, we're not doing our news now because of resource issues, but we really want to get back to that. I'm going to pick up on uh, Mr. Fisher's comment and say that, you know, again, don't Mr. Make Fisher was my father. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> David's comment. That um, it, I, the culture that we observed in the small sample of stations that we looked at completely fits what you're saying in that. It, it, and it was used explicitly. Uh, Beth Curley mentions, we didn't use the clip, but they, they, they created a producer culture. Uh, the staff at KPBS when we were there talked extensively about how long it took for them to develop the culture they have. Here's the downside that I see right now. The culture of public radio and of public television is almost, they don't want to mix in the way that may be needed to, to, great, to gain the greatest advantages in a multimedia environment. There's, there's a great deal of comfort in being able to control your immediate space. All general managers understand this. And the idea that you would have to compromise that in order to gain audience advantage is just so hard. Are any of the general managers here really want to disagree with that point? Well, I, your, your point's absolutely right. We've talked about doing the three programs that we do locally, putting those, put, putting live cameras in the studios and doing it similar to what uh, ESPN does with their, uh, with their sports yeah. talk uh, yeah. program. Um, the, but the question is, all right, who are we developing audience for? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who gets to monetize that audience interaction? Do you think the fundamental question is if we could find a, a revenue share model that would happen? Al, you must have gone through the same thinking yourself. We, we actually had a, a, a couple of very good collaborations with Marketplace uh, where, where we, we did share editorial and, and uh, it was under the, the KCET uh, 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 program, if you will. But on the other hand, we have no problem at all sharing. Um, I, I don't think I don't think uh, a true I don't think a true partnership develops if it's if it's not shared. And I think you know each each medium has its own formatic issues. So, for example, uh, what works on a on a television news magazine may not be the same thing that works on a on, on a radio station or or online. But I think or, or even a newspaper. But but I think the idea that you go out and you you can collaborate to collaborate on on. Uh, on the news gathering portion of it is that that's just a system that needs to be built. But I th do think that culture, it, it you have to you have to build that culture and you have to unbuild the culture Absolutely. that you're bringing to the table. You have to sit down and you have to say, okay, from this point on, it's a new culture, and you have to really kind of work it. Uh, but it can be done. A few years ago, our kids gave me a T-shirt that said, um, "Think global." drink local, and it was for some bar in <laughs> Mosa Beach or something. And I'm reminded of that when I think of putting these things together and wanting to get a culture, but wanting to have it that, that spreads throughout, but want to have a feeling of ownership locally as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, when, it's, when we move a little later, I was going to bring some of this up, but I think one of the ways to do it, by the way, we, we just moved into a new building, uh, you know, and we created a new space, and um, we we included space for partners. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I think that in other words that if you're doing if you're doing a show with somebody, if you're doing a, an all media, you know, uh, uh, distribution of content that you're jointly creating, there's no better way to do it than to have people co-located, even if you have to move people temporarily until you get the cultural barriers down. Al, we have a, a webcast, a, a question from our webcast viewer, which you may be the best uh, around the table to answer, which is that's the, the person who asked the question before is asking again. I don't know if you really answered the, 
anybody really answer the question, can you develop a local television news franchise without a PBS or other anchor as a partner? Yes, I mean, we have. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we have a, a show that has had four seasons called SoCal Connected. It's mm -hmm. a weekly news magazine. It's won a Peabody Award. It, uh, it's won DuPont Awards, uh, as well as Golden Mics. Uh, we're, we've had four years of that. It was preceded by five years of a, a show called California Connected that we produced in partnership with three other uh, public television stations in the state. And we had 16 years of a show called Life and Times before that. So we've had, you know, over two decades of, of a local news involvement. And our, our show uh, this year broke four investigations. Um, and and uh, yeah, I, I think that's, it's just a question of what your resource allocation priorities are. And ours, uh, local news is very high. Go ahead, we're, we're, it's time for a break. Uh, how long you wanna go, there's lunch right there. It's, um can we, uh, I know in, those of you who've been to our sessions in Washington know that uh, we break very quickly, grab lunch, come back and keep talking. 15 minutes? So, 15 minutes. 15 okay. minutes, and then we'll have an hour and 15 after that before we have to wrap up, and we're going to focus on the, Cali the local Southern California situation. Okay, 15 minutes. Real quick, and you've got yes. uh, an article uh, in the current that's in front of you right there about more of the nitty gritty of, uh, of the... For a moment, could I just ask us to thank our, our friends from uh, San Diego for coming down here?